Welcome to the channel. This is our next segment of Scientology Stories, and we appreciate you being here today. No matter how you first heard about Scientology, we hope that you will learn from these stories and that we can educate you in the language and practices of Scientology along the way. And here's an important note, whether you're currently in Scientology, an ex-Scientologist, or just hearing about Scientology for the first time, the bottom line is Scientology does not want you to hear these stories. So thank you for listening, watching, sharing, and helping us to educate people along the way in the true nature of Scientology. And with that, I would like to welcome my guest for today, returning for the third time, welcome Jackson. And there you are. Hi, Claire. <laughs> it's me again. <laughs> Welcome back, Jackson. Hello. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this with me. Sure. Greatly. Sure. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> We've been getting a lot of great feedback from you sharing your story. I think it's an amazing thing. Yeah, for the first time, I uh, just wandered over to take a look at see what uh, came of it. And uh, holy smokes, there's... A lot of people that responded. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. So again, thank you. And sure. and as we discussed briefly, um, I think for today, what I would like to do is obviously pick back up. So we left off in at the end of 1982. Mm -hmm. You're 16 years old and have, and you're now a security guard at the headquarters of Scientology. 16 years. Officially old. posted as the first. One of the first security officers, part of the establishment of the security force in the Sea Org. Yes. <clears throat> and so I was thinking that for for our strategy for today, we could perhaps discuss and unpack the establishment and refinement of the blow drill. And you can share your experiences along the way of how that came to be, what that is exactly, um, and just educate people on how that all came to, to, to be a practice in, in Scientology and particularly at the headquarters. Okay. Well, um, the blow drill as stated as, I mean, it literally is titled the blow drill and that came about because at a necessity um, <clears throat> and really based off of one of the L. Ron Hubbard policy letters called uh, on green on white that I had realized um, you know, how do new policies in the C organization or Scientology come about without L. Ron Hubbard writing them? Um, how does something become um, an established policy, again, without L. Ron Hubbard's name attached to it, but always remain as policy as the way to do something? <clears throat> and in that policy, there's a policy, I actually, it just slipped my mind what the title is, but... It's probably text, blow-offs, right? No, 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 no. Okay. No, actually... Um, uh, because my mindset at the time was, how do I get this information to stick with the staff members and also carry on and never be changed? Because what I was about to document had proven success. And every time it was applied, it never failed. And on that theory, I was, you know, I again referred myself back to the green and white policy where, um, LRH or, you know, L. Ron Hubbard, I actually hate referring to him as LRH because it makes me feel as though my loyalty is still there. I understand. <laughs> Slightly <laughs> triggering, <fact>. right? <laughs> yeah, well, it's strangely <laughs> triggering only to that, you know, out of respect, I refer to him as LRH or R, you know, it's like, well, no, no. Um, so, um, anyways, the basic theory was uh, from that my, my understanding of that policy, how do I document this? Because it all started with a, a flood that happened at the imp base, which some of our listeners may have heard about, but. Yes, we, um, we've, we've talked about it a few times that fateful day in August, 1990, but, but tell me, tell me from no. your perspective, how that yeah, all it, went down. It still rattles me to my soul to this day of, of, you know, there's been times in my life that I literally danced with death. Um, and, and I mean, literally, uh, an inch or two, one way or the other, I would have been dead. Um, mm -hmm. this was one of those days with my, and many other people's soul. The day started out just fine, normal, 
normal day at the imp base. I was watching a CST staff member, a, a Church of Spiritual Technology, somebody from up um, up on Mountain Baldy where everybody's come to understand where Shelly's at. Right. Uh, his name was Wade. Do you remember Wade? I do. Wade okay. Starr. That's right. Wade Starr. He was married to Rachel. Yes. And Wade, did, I don't know if you knew Wade's history. Did you know he was a, a jockey? No. Well, his demeanor, his physical size... When you totally put makes together, sense. Like, totally makes sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's really shocking. Yeah. But he's a really cool cat. Anyways, he wanted to leave staff. And he was one of the more, the first handful of significant people that RTC found themselves concerned about and how do we deal with such a particle. So um, part of that was putting them under watch and they were under full-time watch. So it was kind of two categories of people being under watch. And I literally mean watch where there's always a set of eyes in a human being with somebody, excuse me, with somebody else who is falling out of favor in the C organization or with as an MP staff member. And of course, the purpose being that they had not one opportunity in which to make an escape. You wanted to have the door closed, bolted, chained, welded on the opportunities of them leaving at their own discretion. Right. So 24 seven, there was always a security guard assigned to Wade in this case. I was with him that afternoon. Um, you know, it may have, I'm, I'm thinking back now, there was also, I don't know if you remember Joseph. He, um, uh, he used to be the Dur Com. Anyways, he was, he was another guy when it may have been him, but anyways, we'll just use Wade because it was either or that day. So <clears throat> I was down in Massacre Canyon, down at MCI. Um, Where the staff ate their yeah. meals. Yep. And I was there because those that are under watch or had fallen from grace um, could not associate, be associating with the staff. So right. Um, anything and everything that we did, if they had to shower, they had to study, they had to eat, they had to walk somewhere. It was all done and designed around the routines of the normal staff routines. Right. So, so Wade was in complete isolation from any yes, other staff members other correct. than the your, yourself and whoever else was watching him. That's correct. Yes. And so that was... Uh, the directive we were given, and then we learned how to work that and then work our schedule. So if a decision was being made about somebody, a majority of that decision's result would be based off of who's going to be in that area, who potentially could be in that area at the time. No, let's offset it in an hour. So here we are after lunch, could never eat before lunch because that means you get the cream of the crop of the food. Um, so... Um, they would eat, always eat afterwards and uh, play second fiddle to whatever was on the menu. Um, so it was a, a luck of the draw to whatever was left over. Cold. You know, and it was really by design. Yeah. Gotta say. And, and for clarification, just for context, in Wade's case, what was it that made, drove the necessity to keep him welded in, as you put it? Well, um, because of the information that he retained in his head that he had that, 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 you know, it wasn't like information that he had in his wallet that if he left, he'd be leaving with something in writing. No, the concern is, is about what's in people's heads, the information, what they witness, what they know about, um, and all that. So, um, and do you know what that was in Wade's case? Oh, I never knew exactly what took place at CST. Cause at that time us, even the base staff, at Golden Era did not know what went down at CST till later, till Dave did a presentation to us at right. one of the base briefings. But, um, so it was a mystery to me, you know, there's security within security. I couldn't know what, uh, Wade was talking about in his counseling or in his sec checks or what he was writing up. Understood. He, and you didn't even know why he had to stay. Uh, you're, other than you were I simply knew. given the assignment. He is not to escape. Okay. I was burdened with the responsibility. It's not just given an assignment. It's like, okay, Wade's yours. You need to keep an eye on him. If he blows, you're, you're toast. You're dead right. meat. So you're already at the gate running 
uh, in fear with this as assigned responsibility. So, all right, here we are after lunch, August 1st or August 10th, 1991. Oh, 1990, right? Yes, 1990. Yeah, 1990. Uh, the fateful day and the turning point of many souls at the Ant Bay. So um, it, it started to rain. Nobody really monitored the weather at that point. There was no real concern in Southern California. It was the forecast that the weathermen get paid six figures to tell you that it's going to be sunny and clear. <laughs> uh, maybe start off with a marine layer <laughs> in the day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, pretty much predictably, it didn't matter. 365, 364 days of the year was going to be sunny and clear, right? Yeah. Well, that one day of the year came, and um, it started to rain. And I remember that distinctly and having to get inside. And um, uh, So we're down there trying to find food for Wade. And I hear the thunder and lightning, and it's just pouring. And actually, off, I look out the back through the officer's windows, the south side of MCI, I see water sheeting off the roof, thinking, oh my God, it is pouring outside. So I, I bring Wade with me, and I'm like, I start thinking in my head that something's something's going to go amiss here. I need to start paying attention. So I started feeling this 50-50 this pull with, I got this anchor attached to me, but I also am going to need to start going to do something. What that was, I don't know. It was just the, within my nature. I just can't sit there and go and look in awe. It's like, wow, it's raining and pouring hard. <laughs> I know there was some sort of just being in security. We were always involved in some way or another, pretty much everything with the base. So we go out through the canteen, out around the clock in the circle, just past the breezeway. Yes. And I look down the row of the lower lodge. And again, the rain is just sheeting off the entire length of the roof. Like, like oh my gosh. It was just, it was impressive and shocking. And I, and I look at Wade and I said, you know, you're going to need to run around with me because we got things to attend to. So I was kind of making this decision at the time. So we weren't running up to the booth, the main booth, which is near the main entrance to the property. Um, and uh, we got, so we were soaking wet at that point, but nonetheless, uh, PK, Paul Kellerhouse was sitting in the booth at the time, and um, Kenny Siebold, who was the security chief, he was down in MCI, so, or uh, down in building 36. Okay. And um, uh, somebody, somebody called the main booth on the intercom, which at every main gate on the north side and pro on the south side, if you ever look at the map, you'll see these, the main entrance gates. There's one by the garage. There was one across the street from the garage, which was known as the West Gate. Then there was Broadway, which was across from the main booth. Yep. And then there was the main booth gate. So there's four major. And then there was also the, the G's gate. Right. So there was five total main entrances, two to the north side, three to the south side. PK got somebody down at the G's. I think it was Tom Pope, if I remember correctly. Because he was in trouble and I think he was doing some tasks down there or something. Anyways, he, I, I hear Tom yelling, or uh, it may not have been Tom, just some staff member was on the intercom yelling, it's flooding down here, it's flooding down here, and, and you know, it's going through the gate. That's all we could hear. It was really hard to hear. And I got this sense of urgency of through what he was communicating, and I, I said, PK, you need to watch him. I hopped on the rover bike. Which was a TW two hundred, by the way, which you guys are very familiar with. Same color as Mark, the same one that, that I broke my leg on. <laughs> yep, the, the yellow fat tire, and I love those bikes. It was a yeah. great bike. Anyways, I went tearing down there on the highway, and um, I arrived to flowing debris, probably a foot thick, going across the highway at that time. And I parked my bike just to the edge of where it was flowing across Highway seventy nine, and it was going through my wrought iron fence. Now, from here on out, whenever you hear me refer to the security system or anything associated with it, I'll refer to it as mine because I consider that mine. And there's a reason why, because I basically either partook or played a major role in developing and installing what everybody's come to now know about the prison encampment at the base, which is right. the fence and the, the ultra barrier and the lights and the sensors and everything, the cameras. 
Understood. So it was flowing through my gate, and I could start seeing that the the it's starting to stack up, and the gate was starting to take some weight with the flow of debris. <clears throat> so I get off my bike and I start going over there, and I start ankle deep in this mud. I was gonna, uh, I was telling them on the radio, trying to ask PK, open the gate, open the gate, so I can let it flow through, but it wouldn't open because the rod iron was basically all these different stakes stabbing the mud and it was just it, it the, the motor to the gate couldn't handle the weight it was faithless so um next thing you know it, it just this the second wave of debris started to come across the highway now and i'll never forget looking back that the kickstand on my bike was off to the right and next thing you know the bike was half submerged in mud wow and it was still pouring rain and it just all this rain down me is going on in my head and I'm yelling at PK. I go to the intercom. We need to get a stay center. We need to get all hands, all hands, all hands. Get equipment down here. It's flooding. It's flooding. Get something going. It's really tragic what's happening. And um, that's all I remember. Um, so I then watch my fence fold over. Yeah. The, um it just became so much debris. It ended up being five or six feet of mud that came from the north side of the property out of the mountains through what we had thought was a successful. Well, actually, no, we hadn't had the flood channel established in because that was one of the reasons. So all the debris washing off the hill came across to the south side of the property out to Tom's flower plash pasture, basically. Tom Cruise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I only reference that because people have heard how him and Nicole were out there, how he wanted the flower field, field of flowers or whatever. Right. And when I was talking to, um, well, in other conversations I've had about that day, it's my understanding Tom Cruise wasn't at the property that day, but he was about no. to come. Yeah, it was imminent. He was soon to yeah. be there. Yeah. So a lot at that, on that particular day, up to that point, um, a lot of final touches were uh, happening to the units, which we'd always refer to as the G units. Um, and nothing nothing beyond that, just because that's what we always come to know. And I think G stood for ground units. Um, but in, nonetheless, G units, there was G 1 through 10 or 1 through 15, something like that. Yep. Um, and then when we upgraded them and made them livable to facilitate celebrities and VIPs coming to the property. They no longer, there was not so many units. There was like five buildings, five or six buildings, and they all became their own little apartment studio apartments. Yes. So there could, we could only house like six at a time or something like that. So um, anyways, Tom's was just right there inside the gate. It was kind of like the first one. As you pull in the gate, you take it left into the parking lot. And then his was right down there on the right. Anyways, I was watching all this debris flowing through the gate down towards about that building and other buildings and just wiping out all the landscape and witnessing all this. And I don't remember much up until my next, what I next witnessed was, and again, this is in the dead of the summer. So that's when everybody in their uniforms were in the whites. Right. We wore whites during the summer in the dark blues during the winter times and there was Mark Ingber, Mark Yeager, Guillaume, a lot of church executives who had pulled up next to where I'd parked my bike just off the edge and now all of the debris but I'll never forget them stomping through the mud and the contrast between the mud and their whites. Yeah. You could see every little splatter on their whites. Yeah because we're you're talking white pants, white shirt, white shoes, white, white shoes, socks, yeah. everything. Their epaulets. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Their shoulder boards and all that. Um, and I kind of like was quickly impressed with the fact that they did not regard, they, they weren't playing uh ooey gooey staying out of the goo. They just got right in there and started walking towards me and towards where the G's were. Cause I was over there at that point serving the damage. The rain had moved through the debris was still, it come to a trickle at that point. And the majority of the debris and the damage to the fencing and all that. And, the G's all had, they were kind of elevated, so they had crawl spaces underneath them. And whereas Tom's was, it flowed down through and underneath. 
it didn't necessarily intrude inside the building. It just more hit the building, went through and underneath it and around it. Okay. And continued on down. Anyways, uh, I just remember the shock and awe that was on their faces and all that. They spent a few minutes serving the damage, asked what's going on. I told them I have to stay here now that there's a breach in the security fence. I can't just leave. But I did get a hold of the main booth, let them know to get an all hands going. You know, I, you got to start answering. You got to start having solutions to the problems they're seeing. Otherwise, if they ask you, what are you doing about it? And you say nothing. Right. Your life and is going to turn into nothing. Yeah. And for context in, in the C organization, all hands is where every single staff member is activated regardless of their normal posts and positions to rush That's in right. and handle That's an right. emergency. Drop what you're doing and now you're all going to attend to this emergency. Yeah. Literally all of your hands. <laughs> That's right. All of the hands that are there. Yeah. So, uh, I did not know what was going on in, in kind of relatively rapidly. Um, estates crews, the, the property management staff started showing up with bulldozers and shovels and stuff like that. And we started getting to work on getting the fence cleared out because everybody mutually understood security was an ultimate, always a priority. So I almost didn't need to give them direction. Don't take care of the building, take care of the fence first. Everybody just went right to work to get, be able to button up the fence. Yes. And then I also had my guard Karsten come down because he was my security systems engineer. He's the one that would always do the maintenance and engineer solutions to security problems. So, yes. um, and Carson was a cool cat, um, German guy, but anyways, very talented anyway. So he was there and I started getting all this activity going, <clears throat> um, probably an hour or two later, I finally found myself back, back at the booth. I had got deputized some staff to with radios to stand there and watch the property because I security wasn't extremely well staffed or fully staffed at the time so I had to make myself available at that time there was already a system that was in place to utilize staff in emergency situations without getting special okay I could deputize staff members basically and put them on watch so I did that with a three or four males and once i saw that that was secure and the mess was beginning to be cleaned up i went back to the booth to give pk a rundown of what was happening now at this time i was a watch chief okay there was a um seniority of picking order there's a security chief and then we had three separate watches that held eight hours a piece and there was watch A, watch B, and watch C. So watch A started at 8 in the morning, ran 8 hours. Watch B would come and take the swing shift. And then watch C was always the night watch. Yes. So watch C at that time was in bed. Um, but we woke them up because we have a sleeping channel. Everybody's on. You just switch to the channel and call them and wake them up. And you need to come to attend this emergency. So um, I was on watch A. I was a watch A chief. PK was... My guard in the booth, I went back and explained to him what happened. And, you know, it just was in shock. You know, what do we do? Oh, my God. And it wasn't so much at that particular time a shock that, you know, it is what it is. It was like the hill catching on fire. Just almost another day. But I this one this one was an urgent. Now, I mean, I really, like, it was a natural disaster. It was a natural disaster. <laughs> we didn't define it as such. It just, it was a flap. Right. And um, any situation that comes up outside of the norm that requires immediate attention and emergency attention and emergency handling in the C organization was re was titled and referred to as a flap right because it was just like the sails on a ship that once they broke free from their hooks and you can no longer propel forward it was flapping in the wind that's what i understood how the term came about in the C organization so it would require to get your hands out there in emergency now, get out there and put your hands on and get the get it secured so it was no longer flapping. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. That's what I understood to be where <laughs> flap came from, why we called it a flap. I don't know. I've never even, you know, I'm realizing now I never looked it up in the dictionary. Is that what, does flap mean what it means, what it meant to us in the Sea Org? Right. <laughs> you know, I tear my pants and there's a flap now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or I get a pair of those PJs with a flap in the back, you know, I mean, 
<laughs> it has no conceptual connection to how we related what a flap was at the beach. Right. So, all right. So, um, I'm. I remember being there at the booth, and then I. This was probably an hour in after the initial flood took place. That there was a call for an all base meeting down in MCI. Like we we were then assigned to go around and make sure all the staff were emptied out of the building and gone down to MCI because there was going to be a briefing by COB. Okay. And was the storm still coming through at this point? Or no, it, 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 was, it was, it was like a, it was like a flash flood that okay. had happened. Okay. Typical desert flash flood. There was nothing more, nothing less. Yep. Um, we also made sure that the county agencies came out that they knew that highway 79 was officially blocked. So county resources can come out and attend to it. I think fire came out also. The fire department came out just because they do. Um, so. And so just again for context. So the flash flood happens. How many hours after this is this meeting? Is this briefing being called? I'm going to say uh, just after the first hour elapsed. Somewhere between the first hour and the second hour. Okay. The entire base staff were brought together down in MCI. And you kind of felt this, wow, th this is unusual. Yes. Um, never, I don't think it had ever happened. No, it definitely had it never happened. That, that request had never occurred before to have a briefing. It was always on a Saturday after renovations are, are partaking in reno base renovations was done, we would have listen to an L. Ron Hubbard lecture or have a briefing by one of the base executives about the status of things or something we needed to know. Yeah, and even then it was never all the staff. Right. Because there were people on different shifts, night schedules, yeah. et cetera. And just so, just to be very clear, you're saying this was called by COB, by which we mean Chairman of the Board, Religious Technology Center, David Miscavige. And who I call Apple Box Boy. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll explain yeah. why I call him Apple Box Boy. But um, so I I was not at that actual meeting because I was on watch. Okay. But I went out and collected everybody to make sure they were down there. And it was just this round of silence, even except for those that were watching my open perimeter fence down there. Even the staff that were down there with equipment and shovels trying to now dig out that G unit that Tom was about to stay in, um, they were pulled off and brought into the base. Okay. So whatever COB had to say, it was important that absolutely everybody, and that's what was reiterated to us, absolutely everybody needs to be there. So <clears throat> um, that probably lasted a good solid hour, um, only to then find out now, I go back earlier that when I initially went from that flood and had the staff assigned to keep an eye on now the gaping hole in my perimeter fence to the booth, Kenny Siebold, who was the security chief, was down in building 36. It turns out apparently he didn't become involved or pay any level of importance to the situation that was at hand. Okay. And I highlight this because this was a... Um, the dividing line in which what was about to take place. Kenny Siebold was highlighted at this meeting first, right off the bat, as I understood it by Dave of hearing about this disaster that happened and didn't get off of his ass and do anything. Okay. Now, previous to this, there was always some issue that Dave had with Kenny. Kenny, like I had referred to was part before I was established in security, Matt, Pesh and Kenny Siebold and this guy Jim Cup were three people that were originally part, you know, part of security, but they weren't the security force. It's, they were assigned to security. Okay. Um, so Kenny has a long, had a long history in security up to that point. It was at least eight years and he'd always been around. He was a security chief. Everybody always knew him as that. He's a great guy, great demeanor, really cool guy. Um, treated everything very well. And yada, yada, yada. So uh, it, it was kind of like um, uh, when you thought of security, you thought of Kenny. That it just everybody knew him that well. So Dave highlighted his lack of action and responsibility taken with the, the threat that was placed on the base. 
and officially had him removed from post. And again, I say that for some reason, I remember there was some incidents of the past year or previous recent years where Kenny had messed up on some sort of blow, some staff member blowing, and he was kind of temporarily taken off post. He rubbed Dave wrong. I think it was something that he said. Okay. I never knew specifically, but I knew that Kenny used up probably seven of his eight lives at that point in Dave's eyes <laughs> um, right. in terms of being able to trust him. Because, you know, there was people that were expendable, and then there was people that Dave knew that he just had to keep them on, but he would still see to them being disciplined in some way. Right. Ridiculed of publicly somehow or their life ruined in some capacity uh, at his doing. So everybody right. knew clearly that Dave did it. Yep, um, he was anyway, an expert at public yes, humiliation he, of oh staff. Oh my gosh, was he? Yeah, he, it was actually, I think it was a, some pleasure moments of some yep. art in there to him. So, so Kenny was the first fall on that. And then Dave generalized everybody on the base except for the RTC staff had something to do with what just happened. Either an, an executive overlooking, not only not concerning themselves about it and thus carrying some executive decision and order down through the lines to see to that it was addressed and handled and then reported back up to Dave that, hey, this is discovered and addressed and handled to, um, uh, it was really odd. And as I, hearing this was, how is it that everybody on this base could be responsible for what just took place? But nonetheless, when you start looking at the number of people involved from planning, estates planning to you know, the cooks not making sure that there was emergency meals to supply the staff with and whatever. You're, you're trying to fill your own head uh, in, in, an, uh, in an effort to answer the question is, well, what's going on here? Why, is it, why isn't it just one or a handful of people in trouble? Why is it now the entire staff? Right. Or or actually, why is anyone in trouble if there's just a flood? We never of looked a at it that way, Claire. I, I don't know. Think, yeah. I know. I'm just but saying right in now, retrospect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And why the heck was anybody anybody in trouble? And again, you know, you, you, you see these floods, these natural disasters it, in today's times, you at least have this quick thought of, oh my God, why, you know, no one's getting in trouble. Just right. everybody involved just gets, a, gets involved and they address it and they fix it and move on. Right. Not in the world that we lived. Um, so from that meeting that Dave had, and, and he he literally chewed into all this, mostly the Golden Era staff, because at the international base, there was RTC, CMO Gold, HU, Executive Soft, I mean, Executive or ESI, and Gold in CMU. So there were six different, well, CMU became part of gold. So there was five different organizations, official all organizations. All, all official management, top management of Scientology. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you know, five different branches of the upper echelon of Scientology, all in one location. Yes. If anybody knew of you being attached to the IMP base, you were considered an IMP base staff member. Well, within the IMP base staff, Golden Air Productions was considered the service organization to the rest of the staff, the rest of the executives from RTC all the way down to CMO Gold on that property. Yes. So, and that was actually, I think, one of Golden Air's primary purposes was to service the entire property. That's right. To, yeah. to look after it and look after the staff that uh, resided on it. Right. And only looked after, looked after meaning... They had a place to rest their head. They had a place to put food in their belly. Um, the utilities, the electrical, the sewer, the water, and the water supply was all looked after by Golden Air Productions staff. So that was all pretty much underneath the division of a state's organization or the services di division. Services looking after from laundry to feeding to birthing or rooms to stay in and the state was after the existing property its buildings the utilities um, either installing or developing or maintaining in one form or another yes and grounds maintenance and all and, of that yeah from the cutting the grass and trimming the rose bushes to um we want to put a building here we want to modify this building it was their job to see to it that was done so yes 
golden era from that meeting, that base-wide meeting with Dave was assigned confusion. Because apparently we did not have our shit together enough to project Mother Nature coming through our section of planet Earth and deciding to drop two or three inches of rain within 20 minutes uh, right up a canyon up up in North Mountain, which was the hill. That's what the hill that Golden Era, the base butted up to, was just geographically identified as North Mountain. Yes, and by confusion, of course, you're referring to the ethics conditions in Scientology. I was just, just going to explain yes, that. Yes, yeah. which the very mm. lowest one officially You is can't get any lower. And, and being identified in that state... Um, is just the, the the ultimate insult. If anybody was discovered or found themselves in a condition of confusion, either they chose to decide that's what condition they're in or it was assigned to them and people, other people knew about it, you as an individual would knew that you, as Aaron said, you done fucked up, right? You right. done messed up. <laughs> but yeah, you and knew I think it was going to be all... Yeah, and for context, this is lower than enemy and treason it's yeah, the right. very bottom worst condition you can possibly be in yeah. from a scientology perspective and luckily for us that it didn't go any lower because i you know i just think by default you couldn't define anything worse than that state of somebody could be in than confusion yes because confusion is considered all you're doing is running around you you can't grab all these random you have no control on your life whether it's your thoughts or your ability to do the job you're assigned, you just you become a, an ineffective human being in all aspects of your life. Right. Is the concept that's what we thought of those that are in confusion. It really like it almost makes you wonder how they were able to walk and breathe. Right. That's how we would treat them. Yes. Okay. They had no respect get, applied to them, yada, yada, yada. So Dave assigned. Um, the entire Golden Air staff, the state of confusion. And that was my first experience of a mass group condition assignment. I don't think it had ever been done before. Yeah. If I remember correctly. So I think it had been done in the early days with Hubbard. Yeah, maybe. But, but it wasn't a thing. probably not at the, at the headquarters just yet. This was yeah. the start. Yeah, it was the start of a new, re-found, re, uh, you know, unearthed, hey, uh, group conditions. You know, one person pisses you off, they're all going to get in trouble. Yeah. Did and Dave at this time, how doing. many staff were in Golden Era Productions, roughly? Well, of the total base staff, they were the biggest organization. So I would say, if I remember right, because I had to, I literally knew the exact number of base staff there because I it was part of my responsibility to not only know that, but I had to assign every single base staff member a duty or responsibility for the what I'm eventually leading to, which is the development of drills and thus yes. the blow drill. Um, I think there was like 370, no, there was like 428 staff, gold staff. Okay. And that ranged from the, the technical side, those are up qualifications, helping us learn how to learn Scientology, doing the counseling, the normal counseling, not like sec checking, although there were, but those that would provide the spiritual counseling for not only gold staff, but again, they would do all the stuff for the entire base. Right. Um, so where we, we would go to study, we would go to reference um, some L, L. Ron Hubbard written material. We would go get correction and all that there. Um, and uh, I don't even know why I was just referring to gold, but uh, to the well, qual, but um, yeah. anyways, uh, so 400 and some staff yeah. were assigned a state of confusion. Yeah. It, yes. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> you know, You're you good. ask me a question, I have a hundred different answers to give you to that one question. So that's okay. That's why we're both here. Yeah. <laughs> Glad Freaking to help. Frackers, man. Um, and you could start feeling the, when that, that confusion came out, I actually, you know, and I think part of Dave's delay of having this base briefing and I think it was two maybe three hours later because he had a goldenrod and a goldenrod to hand out to everybody the entire base staff a goldenrod was a written ethics order uh, either on an individual or a group of people that was publicized to the entire base about 
a pretty moderate, significant situation that, that every staff member now needs to know about. Yeah, and don't forget that a copy of that was also put in all of their ethics folders. Yeah, and that's part of it. It's 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 the public documentation of somebody done screwed up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um. So, uh, and again, it was like because he, you know, in the short period of time in Sea Org life in the Sea Org world, two to three hours is like fifteen minutes later. So to to suddenly. Dave, having arrived and delivered this soul beating to everybody, he also had Goldenrod prepared announcing uh, and assigning Golden Era Productions as an organization in confusion. Because mm -hmm. there was also other things that contributed to his development of that, which was the, the, the cine crew having difficulty getting films out, the tapes crew having difficulty getting numerous tapes out to uh, the cassette players out in the orgs not working or the projectors to show the films on and the organizations weren't going good just dave was always saying there was some screwed up arm of golden era in some way or another with the dissemination of l ron hubbard's written in t uh, lectured works right so, and of course that's in reference to golden era another function that they or other functions they had was to produce all of Hubbard's lectures on cassette All the audiovisual products the of films. Scientology. Yes. That's right. Yes. So they had a huge manufacturing and dissemination role and purpose. Yeah. Uh, from an audio division to a filming division to um, cassette, which was part of it. But there was a whole cassette, like t tape cassette line of assembling those lectures on, into cassettes and then the binders that go with it and then the shipping department to ship them out and it just it was we're not going to go down that path but it was very diverse and in in Scientology world well organized but Dave always felt there was incompetent people behind all those divisions so yes he found himself constantly having to put fires out everywhere anyway so the flood now having occurred was the tipping point in his mind that this organization Golden Era Productions is in a state of confusion. So he publicly announced it. Assign, signed by him. You know, it wasn't literally signed by his hand, but it was publicized by him, chairman of the board. And you can't issue something in his name without him knowing about it. So to say that because his name wasn't on it, OSA, doesn't mean that he didn't know anything about it, didn't have anything to do with it. Yeah, he had I'm, everything I'm, to do with it, <laughs> and I'm sure his initials were at the bottom because no, it was chairman. Always it was were. always chairman of the board, right? And you yeah. know what? As a yeah. side note, this chairman of the board crap, yeah, <laughs> I had understood because there was a, and I'm just, I find it important to kind of divert off here just a little bit, yeah. Um, you know, people have come to understand that we're full of acronyms and little special names for stuff, and. That came from L. Ron Hubbard changing his name from L. Ron Hubbard on documents he would send us or, or, or exchange with us staff members at the base. Signed LRH, you know, his LRH shorthand. He started identifying himself just with an asterisk or what we called a star. Yes. And it was always have an L comma and then a star. And you knew that was from L. Ron Hubbard. That way he didn't have his name directly attached to the documents. Well, this chairman of the board crap, um, I understand Dave developed that name be particularly because he was wild with the cool factor that Frank Sinatra had. That That's what everybody called him, the chairman of the board. Huh, I didn't know He that. wasn't like part of a board. And that's, you know, yeah, I'll openly say it was hearsay, but it made sense to me. How, did, how does chairman of the board fall into the militaristic Sea Org type title? Right, and it never it never made sense to me it never because made there sense. is there is no board. So well, on top of it, you <laughs> later came to find out that there actually was no board, or actually there was a board that was stated it never met. Right. For legal purposes, it had to. I mean, I do remember those because there was a time we were educated on that process of the reforming and reestablishment of the legalization of Scientology. Um, and it was explained to us that there was a board. Yes. Because I remember there were some people that were actually in the UK that were part of this board. And I, you know, that uh, 
there's a picture that only you and I right now, Claire, would understand. But remember the original IAS one taken out in front of St. Hill with Dave and Mark and Kenny Lipton? and Yes, I was there and, for that at nine yeah. years old. <laughs> well, all those people, some of it's, you know, there was a girl, Brigatti, I think her last name was. She's kind of a heavy set English lady. She was in finance. Okay. She was on it. She eventually came to the base. But anyways, there was a board legally identified legally so they could be presented to the IRS that these names and these are the people on the board, but it never met. And they had to create false meeting minutes that these people would sign never having attended and all that just to keep up appearances. Anyways, so this chairman of the board um, signature was on the golden rod. I'm getting back now to the uh, context here. Um, so the golden rod was delivered to us all. We all had copies. So suddenly the room had this, whoops, Suddenly the, the room had this colorful, everyone was holding a goldenrod sheet and you can kind of see that ambiance about it. It's like everyone's reading this like, oh my God. Now, mind you, this is the entire, bay, all the base staff were there. So it wasn't just the 400 and some odd gold staff. It was the 860 some odd base staff that made up the, the imp base that were yes. in attendance. So, um, Dave hands it out, assigns Golden Era Productions Confusion. Wendell Reynolds was the commanding officer of Golden Era at the time. Another gentleman who has a very dynamic history in relation with Dave in particular. Um, but nonetheless, the Wendell was the seal gold. And not only was there an impact of us as staff members uh, being assigned, being part of this condition, this confusion assignment, you also damn well knew that the executives above you within gold were going to be treated 10 times worse because they were the executives. They were the ones large and in charge. And they actually, if I was going to do amends, if I was going to do two hours of amends to make up the damage, they had to do 200 hours. Right. You know, it just that's the way you looked upon yourself to hire the up the food chain you were so i always reference the higher you climb in scientology the longer and harder the fall yep so the Shelley, higher you Shelley are miscavige used to say all the time uh with rank comes responsibility that's right yeah and you know i i kind of conceived that in my own mind that boy the, the higher you climb the harder you fall yes. just because i bore witness to everybody that fell so, uh, and nonetheless, here we are knowing this, this thing been delivered to everybody, the shock and awe, they're like, oh my God, everybody at that point in golden era was off of their normal jobs. None of their, none of their responsibilities mattered at all anymore, except for now, because we allowed this flood to happen, every staff member needed to be in, involved in fixing it. Kenny Siebold was the first person taken off of his normal job. He was taken off as a security chief. We had no security chief at that point, but I remember that his, he actually had to get out of uniform and go down there and start getting dirty. Uh, he wasn't assigned under watch. I don't think there's any concern about it, but nonetheless, he was no longer the, the once long-term security chief. Everybody knew that he was in... in in bad with the man in charge. Yep. So, um, that everybody stayed up that entire night. All we did was go down there and, and there, there wasn't just flooding there. There was up at the villas, the lower and there's lower, lower, middle and upper villas, right? Right. Dave and Shelly lived in the lower villa, the driveway that came down to the lower villa that then would run along from the lower to the middle villa and you couldn't drive to the upper villa you had to go around um but the come down that driveway during the flood a lot of water came down that and the drain that was down there to catch and take away that water it had built up into a pool and seeped into dave and shelley's storage because on that side the north side of the lower villa was their storage unit which stored all their personal belongings and all the day all the gifts that dave was ever given on his birthday and Christmas. Right. And there was a little kitchen set up there for his stewards to make his meals and his snacks. The center would bring him up there and that's where the um, Irene and uh, 
Georgiana. Georgiana would sit there and they'd put it all together, put it on their plate and take it in to Shelly and Dave. Anyways, so that took some water damage. And Dave also was really upset by that. I think he was communicating to the base staff how more upset he was about that, that his life was ruined because of us allowing Mother Nature to disrupt his world. Right. Um, so uh, there were that was being attended to, and also all the mud down at the property, and then anywhere else there was damage. You know, there was just it was just all over. So yeah. Um, all night, everybody stayed up all night. I think we stayed up for the next two days without sleep. And and within that, there was a whirlwind of other activities. What's going to happen here? Next thing you know, there is a mission. Uh, now, I say mission. In, in the Sea Organization, when there is a situation of significance that needs to be addressed um, to meet the overall mission and goals of Scientology or the Sea Organization, a specific set of people who are considered the best people to be assigned to address this issue and resolve it are assigned a mission. They're given a mission. Like your mission is to go address this and hear your orders. So it basically is an assignment. A mission is now a newfound assignment that you're pulled off your regular duty. You're usually assigned to either somebody overseeing you that you report to your daily progress and give and, you gives you guidance. It, yeah, the only other comment I'd add to that is the mission has seniority over the Anything executives that they're whatever situation they're they're going into an organization they are senior. You do not screw with them whatsoever. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And when you receive, when you as an area or an organization are the recipient of said mission, that mission is all you answer to. Yes. Nobody other than that mission can give you direction even if it's ups <laughs> or cisco delivering food if they have we need to change our schedule here it's got to go through the mission strangely yes. enough because they but, are there to handle a situation that the local executives fail to deal with in which correct. case in this case a flash flood <laughs> and, and in this case they were they're assigned absolute responsibility for that entity they are now on mission to address so yes. they become they assume anything and all responsibility for golden air productions yes now knowing how the sea organization and the base works you know they are answering to dave every day of course the, the two people assigned to this mission was greg willhair and james Byrne. um greg willhair was always he was um he was the inspector general recently up until this point like he found himself in trouble what was under some sort of handling, but coming at the successful end of moving through that handling and now had to prove himself to Dave, which is, it was always a proving pissing game right. amongst the executives. But that's the way Dave treated him. You always had to prove yourself to him. Yep. You couldn't just say, sir, I fixed this and be entrusted with him understanding that you're honestly saying that he would actually have to see some sort of example. So, Greg Wilhair was assigned the mission, like the gold. It was called the gold mission. Yes. Um, and he was the one in charge. And then James Byrne was his deputy, his assistant. James Byrne was somebody who has long history in this organization, was on the original ship. His wife was a reg down in Los Angeles. But James had worked up the rank. He was at the base. I forget why, but nonetheless... He had a lot of involvement with the original Sea Organization drills of doing these emergency tasks and how to organize, uh, go about organizing them to do them on the ship. So if suddenly the, the ship was at rough seas, he developed the processes and procedures and how to deal with suddenly the ship finds itself in rough waters. What do we do and who's going to do what? James figured it all out and, this, and, and oversaw the assignment of it and the execution of it. Yeah. So, And it's probably the, important to note that that also included not only documenting it as a procedure, but also having people dummy run and run through over and over and over again until it became second nature. Yeah. It was almost the, the only time you could truly screw up in the Sea Org and, and not be disciplined for it because it was understood that it was being developed. Yes. And it was expected to figure out the rights from wrongs. Yes. And if you unfortunately broke something or damaged something 
or mess some procedure up or piss somebody off, you couldn't necessarily get in trouble. Well, you could it, be made to pay was, for it yeah, still. Yeah, if you yeah. Broke something. <laughs> yeah, I guess it wasn't the full scale in trouble. You, there was they they you can never get away with never being disciplined with something at least. Yeah. Nonetheless, um, so they were brought in to be the gold the gold mission ice the gold mission. They were in charge, and so the day after. The day after the flood happened, I was pulled into the the conference room in Building 36 by Mark Ingber, um, who was he was the watchdog committee for Golden Air Productions at that time, and um, Greg Wilhair and James Byrne, and sat down at the table, and Mark just looked me in the eye and says, "You're going to become the security chief." Mm. And it was a moment in my life that I was like, wow, I'm entrusted now to be the security chief. And you just, you just know in that world to be entrusted with some sort of assignment like that. And, and you know, I, whatever. I just remember having that run through my bones. It's like, wow, you know, I've kind of proven myself and this is a responsibility and you become aware of it. And like, holy shit, how quickly Kenny could be shot. I could be just shot just as well. But I wasn't really concerned about that. But now I was tasked as with with the job of security chief for the int base. Yeah, and it became official. An issue was published. The whole nine yards. So and at this point, you're 24 years old. 1990. That's correct. Okay. Um, but I had already been in security from '82, so that was eight years. Yes. <clears throat> well, yeah, seven and a half to eight years. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, to every one year in the Sea Org is like dog years. It's you have seven years of experience in one year. <laughs> That's right. Actually, literally, by the number of hours we worked, it's That's probably right. not far off. <laughs> that, well, yeah, probably if you really did the math, that would that really hold some water. Yeah. To the truth. Mark and I did that once, and I think we should be eighty in our eighties. Oh yeah. 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 By the gosh. Number of yeah, sometimes I feel like I'm in my 80s week. with these wrinkles. And <laughs> anyway, back to your story. <laughs> hair's growing in places it shouldn't be growing. I'm like, what the hell is happening here? Anyways, okay, so now I'm officially the, the Imp Base Security Chief, and that was the official title. It wasn't just Security Chief, it was the Imp Base. I was responsible for every staff member on that base. And um, it's kind of like um, I was I had authority over the security of every imp base staff member and that included Dave himself. Mm. So I can make decisions and this is where my whole involvement with Shelly became accelerated because she always interacted with me about different security concerns for Dave. Yes. Behind the scenes stuff that we would talk about or plan or lay out. Um, so um, here I was, this newfound responsibility. I, I really didn't mind and I really felt bad for Kenny that really I, you know, Kenny and I were really close. I felt like I lost my best friend. And you can't be caught associating or talking with him at that point either because it, it, people knew that he was a piece of shit. And if you were sitting there caught giggling with him or talking with him, they figured that you were taking on the colors of this now publicly stated enemy. Right. Or even showing empathy to him. Isn't yes. that right? Couldn't, yeah. couldn't do that. Yeah. Could not Persona do that. non grata. Was totally amazing when you think back at that. Holy shit, Blair. Yeah. The disregard that we would just cast upon our own. Anyway, that's yeah, that's that's a daunting realization when you look at it. I agree. <clears throat> so, okay, so now part of the gold mission. Now part of the gold mission is we're going to evaluate what threats could exist for the property that we need, need to now take a serious look at and develop a solution for we had threats of earthquakes. We had obvious threats for floods. We had threats for fire up on the hill or uh, within a structure on the property, or we had uh, threats towards base security. So fire, flood, earthquake, and security were four areas that are identified we need to develop handlings for. What are we gonna do with them? How are we gonna address this? I was tasked with the answer to that question. Um, James Byrne was not, nor was Greg Wilhair. They took the liberty to burden me with it. So I suddenly am under this extreme mental pressure of is how do I, 
how do I care for an earthquake happening to property? Not only looking after the staff members, but dealing with any fallout from it. Because you can't control a building. That was just a naturally accepted thing that um, you can't control a building from damage. What are we going to do if a building get damages, gets right. damaged? To a flood, how are we going to address the flood issue and deal with it? And then the security aspects and then fire. So those four aspects, I had to sit there and, and analyze and summarize and figure out and develop a plan of an effective plan that would bring rest of concern to anybody on the base, including, the, excuse me, including Dave. Yes. Um, that he would be either through his own lack of knowledge and lack of understanding of what an earthquake is or what a fire is and how you handle it. Like, um, he, there was a level of entrustment that he had a, amongst those that he knew were assigned with tasks. He always drew judgment on, is that the right person to solve this? That if he did, you know, if he felt that Greg Wilhair or James Byrne in this case assigned this task, such as developing these drills for these four different aspects, was assigned to somebody that Dave did not feel comfortable with, all he had to say is get somebody else. Right. So um, in this case, I was tasked with doing this. At this time, I don't, yeah, I was already a volunteer firefighter with the local fire department, R Riverside County Fire. Okay. Slash Cal Fire, which is what it's known now, but Cal Fire is contracted with Riverside County. Cal Fire being a state fire agency contracted by Riverside County to provide personnel and resources as a economical means to provide its own fire department countywide. Okay. So they, they had a long-term count. Anyway, so I was part of the California Department of Forestry slash Riverside County Fire Department as a volunteer firefighter. At that particular time, I was an engineer. An engineer is a fire apparatus engineer, someone who drives and pumps the engine at the scene of a fire, a considered a company officer. So I, I had this backbone of knowledge of emergencies. And I also just through my nature of wanting to be a firefighter from the age of seven, had this natural drive and ability to analyze and look at a situation. And I just loved it. I loved being a firefighter. Um, I just loved being that person that a person in society of this world can call upon to receive help and help bring resolution to a confusion or a moment of pain to their life and not, you know, not knowing what to do. And that's the definition of emergency is people don't know what to do. So it becomes an emergency. You know, you need to do something, but what do we do? Right. Well, fire department is part of here's what we do. So anyways, I was loaded with the wealth of knowledge and I had realized that, gosh, I could just translate this from the fire world into the Scientology C organizational world and teach my staff. Mm -hmm. So I had access from the fire department through a lot of historical earthquake information. I learned all about earthquakes, um, uh, the geographical layout of planet earth. Um, I had developed, helped develop this internal book that we I don't know if you remember that booklet about earthquakes that was put together that Kate and Alan Paval were on a mission. I do um, remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that was something else that I was proud of because that required a lot of research and looking into uh, learning about the plates of planet Earth and how they move and the volcanic activity and <clears throat> where the fault lines are in our area around planet Earth and how that one over on that side of Earth affects the ones over here on this side of Earth. And I also used the USA Today paper um, because I had to figure out and start tracking and learning how to track weather systems because part of being able to be effectively in control of floods is you had to keep an eye on the weather. Right. Um, so. Not that that would give you the capability to prevent a flood. No. <laughs> no, but having, you know, and the, part of the problem is that that flood that happened on 10 August 1990 was we had no idea it was coming. Right. So, but what it did lead us into, at least, you know, and I got to say that 
these drills force us into this wake up call of the environmental threats that laid amongst us mm -hmm. that we otherwise should have been attentive to such as even like a current like a homeowner right now like me as a homeowner if you just observe the obvious and go well holy smokes you know i need to look after my roof i need to look after my plumbing make sure that it's not decaying you can't just assume it's always going to exist it needs some hands-on attention so once you realize that and become educated about that situation and start learning about what to do knowledge is power right so without knowledge you have no power and again, that was something that I realized when I was a firefighter. And that's the difference between a firefighter and a citizen is they look to the firefighters, the wow factor, what I called it, is to what do I do in this emergency? Right. So because they figured out what to do in these emergencies, they went and helped people in society. So I took that same concept and brought it to the base and applied it to all these four aspects, fire, flood, earthquake, and security. So... The reason I led up to what I'm now going to talk about, which is the development of the blow drill, is I became very good at developing drills. I had to start documenting all these procedures. Yes. And teaching all the staff. And I taught the staff on the weekends, on Saturday, every Saturday morning. I had to, I had to present a drill and then drill the staff on it. Whether it was teaching them how to do CPR or the Heimlich maneuver to this... Uh, Performing and executing a national security drill, assigning everybody and overseeing it, managing it <clears throat> base wide, setting up and doing. You probably remember these drills. I do. Claire. Yep, we used to do them every Saturday morning. And that was me. You know, that was 800 staff that were directly affected by my decisions and my planning and my actions. And I really felt proud about that. I really felt this bond that every staff member was a one-on-one -on -one to me. Mm -hmm that's the way I felt that's the way I looked at it. it's the way I addressed it and I loved it it was right up my alley um, it made a lot of people happy it brought a lot of rest to a lot of concerns and um, brought the backbone undertone of the whole property up a notch in that we know what to do yeah I know how to use a fire hose I know how to apply dressings to an open wound um, I know how to help stop an intruder you know, whatever. Right. It, it just was this newfound ability for base staff. And it also supported that group theory in that it made us a solid group. Um, and there's a lot of humorous aspects to it that came about and were experienced from, you remember the big horn? Yes. Because I had to means like if there was an intruder, how do I, how do I notify all the base staff within their buildings, whether they're in a, uh, counseling session or they're recording a song in the studio shooting a movie in mci or cooking dinner down to mci or like shooting a movie in, in the cine studio or whatever out mowing the lawn out in the south 40 of a 525 acre property um <laughs> so i had figured out a ship's horn sound waves travel the distance of the horizon and from anywhere you stand on planet Earth, if you're on a piece of flat land, the farthest you can see is exactly 40 miles to the horizon. So that straight line that we all are in awe of on a sunrise mm -hmm. where the sun comes up, that is exactly 40 miles hmm. in which the Earth starts bending from any point of your ground level perspective of that point is considered 40 miles. So the ships, because they are at sea level, zero foot elevation they had to develop a means of communication for that distance because ships just don't stop on a dime right so they realized that there was a low end to the sound spectrum and a high end to the sound spectrum allowing it to penetrate through fog and uh, buildings structures mm -hmm. so that's what the low end for was to create those vibrating sounds through a building and the high was just through the natural uh, atmospheric air that you could hear a loud sound so I researched located and had purchased and then installed two ship horns up on top of the garage <laughs> and then I had to start realizing how to how did the staff get used to know that catch an ear for that sound and uh, plus I had to test it often to make sure it always works so I came up with this idea we'll just sound it every day at noon 
because that thought came from the Flintstones, believe it or not. <laughs> when the work day was over, they would say, you know, I don't know if you remember the Flintstones, but part of the introduction when you watch any cartoon, it was just always <laughs> Fred getting off work when that whistle was sounded and he'd go, Yahoo! <laughs> and now he would go running to get home to Wilma. And I thought, God, at 12, we can just sound the horn exactly at 12. That way the bass staff knows that it's noon and then they can hear the horn and it starts educating their ear and plants that scene in their mind. So I thought, oh, what, how cool is that? So that, if you remember every day at noon, the horn would sound, right? Yep. I remember. So, um, <laughs> and as a side note, cause it was on, uh, uh, up on top of the garage, those that were in the garage would hear it the loudest. Yeah. So I used to call, we used to call, from the main booth and just humor ourselves and call down to motor pool who was right below the sound and either jb or dave medina or jenny or yvonne were down there in motor pool and they'd answer the phone they go motor pool <laughs> and the moment they would answer i would time it that the moment they answered i hit that horn just so i knew <laughs> scared the shit out of them anyways it was humorous yeah so anyways okay so i developed these four drills fire flood earthquake and security became my forte to be able to figure out uh, the solution to a problem. And again, I fall back on what I was referencing earlier is that L. Ron Hubbard green and white policy that these drills that I'm developing become the procedure that is not altered and not changed. It is set in concrete and it's utilized forever and nobody is authorized to change it. And that was part of what I needed to teach my crew is that these are demonstrated procedures to achieve the results that we're after, which is to not be the effects of flood, what to do with the fire, how to deal with the security threat, etc. So yeah. I, you know, my whole point was to get not only the gold staff's ability raised in competence, but to give the entire base a sense of security overall from these either real or perceived threats. <coughs> Excuse me, these real or perceived threats. And I think I, you know, I had to do that all within, you know, part of me achieving this was on a time frame because Greg, for Greg and James Byrne to be considered completed with their mission would mean Dave would have to upgrade us out of confusion. Yes. So being in that state of confusion, we had to move up the different states of the L. Ron Hubbard conditions from confusion to treason to doubt to liability and be upgraded. I think it was into, into a state of emergency is what David announced in that original goldenrod that we could not be considered normalized until we were into a state of emergency or normal, I think. He either stretched it all the way to normal or at least in emergency. Okay. Now, part of the, the undertone of it is August 10th is two days before the anniversary of the Sea Organization. And August 12th is actually the day of any given year that in which the history of the Sea Org reaches another year. So it was the anniversary of the Sea Org on the horizon. And yes. we all look forward to Sea Org Day. Sea Org Day was that one day, which was the entire day we could shed our uniforms and have fun and have team games and have apple pie and watermelon and watch movies. And the day was ended with our ceremony of promotions where people right. would move up and be publicly announced and recognized and come up and and it was like a firefighter getting pinged with their badge after getting through the fire academy right it meant that much to us so people would work all year to do good to eventually hopefully get promoted um come sea org day and dave was always the one that well dave or somebody he delegated would be the one to announce and pin people or hand out the, the ranks the new yes. ranks um, and I think it even included himself one year uh, hmm. where he, I, anyways, I, I just remember thinking, I'm just now remembering just a quick blurb of a thought. It's like, wow, he just uh, pinned something on himself, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> I think it was another ribbon. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah. If you remember that ribbon that had the red velvet background with the single star in the center, it was something special for something. But anyways. Yes. The campaign bars that they yeah the campaign for... bars because those are good issue too. Nonetheless, 
um, we had to get up these conditions and get up to normal. So I, I was on a time frame to, and, and it wasn't just these drills that Golden Era needed to get through. All aspects of the disorganized in Dave's eyes, aspects of gold needed to be fixed too. Whatever the the meter department was not doing right, they had to fix that. Whatever the city department or division was messing up on, they had to fix that. And then the state's department, all the equipment had to get upgraded. Everything had to basically get fixed in in all the way down to the galley and the the way this it just was the details were incredible. Yes. Um, incredible. And Golden Arrows was burning. That's all we started to do. No longer were we producing tapes every week. Excuse me. We were fixed on fixing ourselves. So, every day we were doing drills. And part of it were James Byrne developed drills where we had to do marching drills. And yes, yes sir drills. And march as a group. Because part of the end result of moving out of this condition is we had to present ourselves like a military would do on their final day of graduation where all the officers would sit there for review of the troops and they come marching through. You've probably seen that on the news where there's spectators looking down on the troops marching by, right? you know, with the guns and the flags and everything. Well, we had to do the similar thing as part of our final getting out of the condition is we had to build a march around as a group perfectly. So we learned how to dress ourselves in as you would do the military, <clears throat> you know, dress right, dress forward, do the about phase, how to spin, how to march, you know, forward march. And literally there was people who were drill instructors. And I think Andre Tabioyan had the most military experience. So he'd be the one that would come forward to sound off. Mm -hmm. I think there may have been someone else, but literally to sound like an actual drill sergeant, lift, 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 right, lift, you know, and then they, they, they won't literally say left, left. Okay, guys go right, right. You know, it wasn't that it was lift, 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 right, lift. And then if, if anybody's listening or watching him military history, the more serious the instructor is, the less you can actually hear him sound the word. It's just more of a sound. If, 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 right, left, hey, ha, hey, ha, ha, ho, ho. And you're going, what is he saying? But the troops know what he's saying. So that's the type and level of dr drilling that we would do as a group. Yeah, funny side comment for you, by the way. Years later, when I was in Religious Technology Center, I had to run those drills with all of INT, the INT executives. Yeah. So, yeah, and see, yeah. and Dave used <laughs> no, these. No, no, I, for clarification, I had zero qualifications to do so, no right. military experience, just someone showed me what to do. Or actually, you know, I had done it many, many times from what you're re referencing. Yeah, and, and you as a, you know, IMP-based staff member, I would say, Dave would put anybody below him to the test. It's like, you go run that group Yeah. to check your competence or to rattle your cage in your wagon in some way. That's right. To wake you up. And yep. little innocent Claire would be sent off to do this. And like, <laughs> holy smokers. Yeah. yeah, but you would do it. And that was the tricky, that was the that was the ultimate glory and competence of being a Sea Org member is willingness to take on any task assigned and figure out the solution to this problem. Right. So, funny that you say that. So, anyways, <laughs> um, I developed these drills. And in the meantime, there was people blowing. And so the demand to come up with the actual working solution was so intense that some people have a way of tying their shoes. I'm just going to give this an analogy. You know, what is it? Around the running, the loop, rabbit hole through and pull up. You know, there's this, as you grow up, you establish this, how you teach your kid to tie a shoelace. Right. Well, um, I had to figure out and eliminate all the not do's and get to the do's and how this is going to work really fast, really hard. And then I had, you remember all the Chinese schooling that we would do where I yes. would make those big charts and Chinese schooling is in reference to the Chinese during their schooling. And the way they, they taught the masses is they would put on big pieces of paper that 30, 40, a hundred people could see at one time. And a person would stand there with a pointer stick. And, and if it was about how to peel a banana, you would have step one and you would announce step one and everybody would repeat step one. 
Yes. And you would say, hold banana. Hold banana. Step two. Step two. Grab top of banana. Grab top of banana. And it would <laughs> sound off this sound in your head. Yes. So it just plants the seed of what you do. And here's a little trick to our listening viewers of how effective it is. And when were you last there, Claire? 2005. And that's how many years? <laughs> It's 2005, now. so it's like 18. 18. Yep. So, and I was last there in 97. Right. So here's something that both Claire and I at one time knew, and we will be able to sit here and sing off to you. A team. Ready? <laughs> yep. A team, a team has a tendency, tendency to, know to know what, what the, the other, other team, team, team members, members are, are doing, doing and thinking, thinking and coordinate. coordinate. Thereby and, and therewith. With. Okay, we'll save everybody yeah. else. A little minute. <laughs> but, I know I, I did that quote for for my TED Talk <laughs> video that I did. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So yes. So yeah, and, and we and, and to me again, like you said, it, when you chant it over and over and over again, that's the whole point. Is that it is indelibly in your head, it cannot right. be removed. That's right. And L. Ron Hubbard discovered this in whatever researches that he did in his feeble life and introduced it into Scientology's teachings and, I mean, the C organization's ways, procedures and policies and how to teach people, badass people, basically, is the way he looked. They want to make a C org member a badass person. Well, how do you rattle their wagon to get this datum in their head of what they need to do in an emergency? So Chinese school is an effective way of doing it. So... I would develop my drills in the do Chinese school with the staff to teach them, such as how to do the uh, Heimlich maneuver. Um, and I had to do these big charts. And anyways, so after successfully doing this, getting approval and getting upgraded from Dave, it took us a solid year to get through that. A solid year because we literally made it by the skin of our teeth to the next Sea Org Day, 1991. Oh, wow. was our target date. It took that long. Yep. Um, and Dave would not let us do anything else until that. So I could be wrong if it taking a year. There was some sort of significant event. Could have been Christmas. The idea is we were going to be rewarded well with some time off by achieving it. Getting After having had no time off for a year. Oh, my God. So, again, I get back to when I was doing these drills, I was still playing role of security, and there were still people blowing. People leaving with unannounced departures. That's what a below is defined as in the C organization is basically pff, they're gone with the wind. Yeah. And and out here in the real world, we call that escaping. Escaping. That's yeah. correct. Um, but they got to put some stink on what escaping means. They're going to call it a blow. <laughs> right. Yeah. Not escaping as though when you hear that, you go, man, somebody must have been caught in a serious situation to find themselves needing to escape from it yeah exactly i know you jumped the fence to get out of here but you weren't escaping you were blowing blowing it that's right unauthorized departure that's right <laughs> so i'm hoping that our our listening public can understand the difference between what an escape is to what we as sea org members understood a blow to be when you hear if you heard somebody saying they escaped that would like we were just finding it leads you to believe that somebody found themselves needing to get away from something that is needful no yeah. we put some stink on that what escape means and said blow <laughs> and it's funny now that you say that there's really no difference it's just a matter of perspective perspective yeah and that was the point the trickery of the c organization is they always change the perspective of what was being communicated to put some stink on it <laughs> <laughs> and True. it was the, that stink was to control your soul yes that the backbone of any cult is to put some stink on this common and, and, and logical it, idea. And not only to uh, control it, but make it die a slow death. That's right. Kill and, that life source. <laughs> yeah. So the fact that when you're going to make a decision to leave, it's not of you escaping the hot stove. It's, you know, getting away and reducing that threat. It's you're now moving into a classification as a human being as an entity that you are betraying this ultimate trust that you gave. So you are therefore a piece of Tootsie Roll. 
Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Have you have you ever read the book Trauma and Recovery? I have not. Oh, it's one of the uh, fundamental text textbooks on um, PTSD. Anyway, oh, it's yeah. a really, well, it really good sense. book. I'll link to it. But I found it fascinating in there that the foundation of um, like the whole research on trauma and recovery stemmed from desertions in the military. Mm. And yeah. um, starting back in World War II and moving forward. But just one, one thing I'm going to just tell you that's going to blow your mind. They found that if they, in the military, if they establish small units particularly units of five, desertion was less because the loyalty to the fellow soldiers w was deep. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because in our case, that desertion of loyalty was spread to any human being on planet Earth. Basically. Right, and not only that, but in the C organization, and actually in any organization, they structure it so that you have no more than five people working underneath right. you. Right, yeah. and it makes organizational <laughs> logic, you know, not it's the just case crazy, in the C organization. It's crazy yeah. correlation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, there's interesting. But I, I'm hoping people understand the delineation between what Claire and I and Mark and Mike and Amy and everybody refers to about a blow is it is is it's escaping. But the, the group understanding of why that person is no longer with us as though he escaped, he left it's a whole different concept that when a staff member or even Dave or anybody else other than you looks upon the fact that he's no longer with us, he blew, meaning he left here with evil intentions. Yep. He left to go against our goodness or he or she, or they left as a big F you. Yeah. Like the and it was never, there was never any concern like, Oh my goodness, what yeah. happened? What, maybe, no. maybe there's a family emergency. It was nope. never that. It was, it was that's never an evil an person. Human, yeah. yeah. There was no human concern about or compassion addressed to the concern is why they're no longer with us. It was like, right. wow, that dude, what balls. Yeah. You know? So <clears throat> that's just the way blows anybody who was not there, who nobody could be accounted, uh, anybody who could not be accounted for was considered blown. Yeah. And so as the security chief, you were in charge of dealing with it whenever somebody escaped contain well yeah eventually it became to containing the ability for anybody to blow um but it initially started up recovering locating and bringing back those that did blow yes you know a task with that burden of it's your responsibility to find this person and get them back so with those four drills, it now became a forte of mine to build develop drills and again back to that policy that i realized that L. Ron Hubbard did establish how do you develop other policies that are not written by his hand, thus printed on green and white or red and white paper. And it became, it becomes the, the gospel. Um, and having that sense of security that nobody will ever change it, you develop a drill. And the drill is the procedures in which that have been statistically established as the things to do that guarantee a result, a positive result. So... <clears throat> Over the course of my being in security from 82 up until this point, I had been involved with hundreds of blows um, over the course of eight years. And I say hundreds that, you know, I tried to re, uh, recreate the actual number of people that blew with Tom Tobin and Joe Childs during that truth rundown. He, they, they asked me, how many people do you think you actually chased after and brought back. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I can't give you an actual number. Right. I'm my, my first thought is, is which I'll talk about later on my channel was I, my first thought goes to the threats list that I had located in the main booth. It was a written document that referenced every individual that was considered a threat, a staff member that was considered a threat, whether they did something that was, a natural threat to any the C organization it wasn't a threat to a life it was considered a threat to the image of the C organization Scientology or Dave Miscavige so um I which looked included back at, anybody who had said hey I don't want to be here anymore that's right yeah anybody who chose not to be there anymore or anybody that expressed 
um, like Mark gave in that dream somebody had about some pipe smoking with Dave or something like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody that had any any oddity about him and Dave just like just willy nilly take him off. Make them go dig holes was considered Or even a if somebody had a family member who said something negative about Scientology in a letter or a phone call, right? Yeah, it was actually, it, you know, passive statements like, I don't agree with Scientology, wouldn't necessarily be considered a threat. And I'll get into that more on my channel when I do get to it, but about the mail, if we receive during the mail. Somebody's like, you know, I don't get to see you much. What is up with Scientology not letting you go? Right. That wasn't enough to put somebody on the threats list. A letter that would be received or somebody stating as a staff member or otherwise saying this place is bullshit you guys are full of crap your mindset brainwashing bastards and i want my kid back and all and i'm going to do all i can do to it. that was considered a threat yeah so trying to come up with a number of how many people I actually chased down and brought back against their will and osa <laughs> you listening ears you will challenge the fact that no it was never that many people i can tell you this there was no less than 100 souls, but no more than 834 because not everybody blew. Right. Because the, the mindset, a lot of people self-sold themselves on staying. Well, I would pretty to, much to, be, guarantee. To, play, to play devil's advocate <coughs> there, though, Jackson, there were many people who blew multiple times. Uh, and then that was the other thing I <laughs> took into account. I mean, good observation, yeah. but I was just about to mention that. Yeah. I took into account, too, that there was a lot of repeat or what I call frequent flyers. <laughs> because Good the blow one. thing, they were frequent flyers. Right. Um, so, <clears throat> having said all that and everything leading up to this now statement is I had to develop this drill and document it, put it in paper. So, I typed up this document called the blow drill. And I had to submit it to Marty and get approval by Dave. These Marty are the Rathen. proven steps that you go through to find somebody. Yes. Because not only just me, but me and my security force or us security force, we were always, at the base at least, initially burdened and tasked with the fact of finding somebody. And then Dave always had an upper echelon right-hand security person. It would have been Marty. One time it would have been Rick Asneran or Jesse Prince. Somebody that I always found myself working for within Dave's camp that I had to report to and then... Uh, report to Dave. So Dave would either talk to that person in his camp or talk to me. Yes. One way, there was no go through my organizational structure in Golden Air Productions. There was no vias. When it came to the people in situations like this, it was a straight line. Right. And people understood that. And like I was referring earlier, way earlier on our conversation, is as a security chief from the imp base, everybody was my responsibility. So security was kind of considered um a sideline senior to everybody else yes if one of me if me or one of my guards came to you and said you need to get out to ogh you were expected to drop what you're doing without question and go to ogh right we were known to be trusted to what we were saying was true whether it was liked or not would be a different thing but um that's kind of how security eventually became to be known in respected i guess for lack of saying otherwise and how everybody looked upon us i mean we were the ones that created that safe environment for them to perform their sea tasks in without outside distraction right so i guess it was this unspoken thankfulness that you couldn't necessarily think but you knew it was at play because without security we couldn't have a place that you just mindlessly came to and performed your task without any concern about someone leaving a door open or someone hopping the fence to come in and create harm or disrupt operations yeah so and and perhaps since we're coming to the end of this segment for today we could you could kind of run through i know time has flown smokes. by here <laughs> but but describe to me what those steps ended up being in the blow drill well uh generally and in, in not so specifically a lot of it is information gathering and possessing it 24 7 a lot of personal information on every base staff member that I could get my hands of. And so on. where would that information come from? From their life history. To which, is, the, which is the extensive form that any staff member fills out, including what all of their relatives, anyone they were friends with, where they went right. to school, what Scientology they've done, all, everything, right? It's not just a, 
it's far more detailed than a resume for than, example than a regular hiring procedure at any it, it, even in uh, any severe corporate i'm sure microsoft and intel don't have anything compared to what the c organization's hiring process is in terms of filling out you know uh anything beyond um your previous address or who your emergency contact is right this oh, is... and also any connections to any family members in government yeah media your history with the media yeah. your shoe sizes to <laughs> who your first date was any of your friends that would have not looked at scientology or may have it just a complete i mean it wasn't i don't know if they necessarily went the the nth guard the nth uh, nine degrees of trying to figure out uh, what I said in my thing, if they, if who I listed it was my buddies in high school, did they then go look into them like some government agencies do to give you higher level of security uh, clearance? Yeah. But the information you were expected was to provide in written form on your life history from where and you so, went to school to who your friends were. Right. So when you would look when you'd go to the life history what information would you collect for the uh, family job? members their the family members friends who they were where they lived and i would draw from that and create our own list and every staff member had a folder and there was a cover sheet that you'd open it up and on the cover sheet was the basics mm -hmm. their mother's name their father's name where they're located bank information we would collect from the mail if they had a uh, bank community uh, cards or statements coming through because we opened all mail mm -hmm. um and, and if they if they had an organization phone would it include checking those phone yes, records uh, because i started learning about le electronics and learning how to capture that information without the folks even knowing that i was capturing it um and that was another forte of mine um but yeah, uh, and also inspection of their personal living quarters from their workspace without them being present or when they would leave to come into the base or go to work, I would go to their birthing and rifle through all their personal stuff down to checking every pocket of every piece of clothing hanging on every hanger in their closet or in their drawer, inside their shoes, under their bed, uh, between the pillowcase and the pillow, within the pillow. I looked everywhere. And, and what were you looking for? Any information that that I could find about them, but also mm -hmm. always suspecting what I caught. I say, I had this other thing I used to tell my guards. We are the third eye. We are like the, 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 the third eye to every staff member, and especially if you blew, whether you got through your handling or not, you ended up staying and getting back in good graces with the church. You had the saying attached to you, what I refer to as the third eye. Somebody was always watching you. Mm -hmm. Always, always, always. Once you fell out of grace, it can never be undone. Right. Because Dave, the one motivating this constant monitoring concern, would see to it and say, Hey, how's blah blah doing it? You know, you know, give me an update on what what's going on, how they're performing on their job. Have they done anything weird or of concern? Right. Um no, so you're, I would you're always... absolutely true. I mean it, it, I mean you're absolutely correct. You're reminding me that this is what you're describing is the reason I never said, "Hey, I want to leave." Right. That's I just right. knew that when I when I escaped, I better damn well be successful. That's right. Because and get the heck out of there. Because if I got apprehended as they tried to do, which is of course described in Mark's book, what that they tried to intercept me in Las Vegas, I knew I could not fail. Right. Yeah. That's right. And, and even if, if you did fail and come back, you knew forever, you're, you are now tainted with having blown. And I would never have the opportunity to do so again. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and it, well, people figured out new eventful ways, eventful, uh, like inventful, not event as in, though an event, but no. inventful, like they would invent new ways that I would always have discovered through their counseling or sec checking and then i would go out and fix with my security system if i hadn't already thought about it myself right in other words it got harder and harder and harder, harder harder and harder yeah. so uh developing all these different steps and i and i get the details of how thorough i would go through people's belongings um and it wasn't like if we found an unopened gift we wouldn't necessarily open the gifts but eventually we found that people 
would be sending stuff in through these wrapped gifts. And like uh, if, if you ordered a new pair of socks and it came in a plastic bag that was sealed with glue or something, we would still go into that packaging and open up and then rifle through the socks. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. Just to convey to our listeners how thorough and intrusive we were to people's lives. Because I questioned this at one point to Osa. Is this right? Do we have the legal right to do what we're doing? And it was reported back to me that, yes, we do, because we own the property that they are on. Mm. And as the property owners, we legally can go through their their belongings. Interesting. I'm so no lawyer. I, I do wonder if that's actually true. It's not <laughs> <Of> true. <course. laughs> it's true to a degree. Right. But like because, uh, an but apartment. But they're not the landlord. No. They, they had no landlord agreement. They had no landlord right. authority. They they considered themselves own as owners of. And thus, we were considered owned. Right. So therefore, the church has the right to go through. So that was a concept that I changed for myself and how I approached and became serious about my drill is no grounds are off limits mm. to my ability to go capture and document and and create and, and hold on to personal information of people. Right. Nobody knew about this. If Claire, if you ever knew that I went through your panty drawer and I say that humorously, but literally grotesquely at the same time, yeah. to, to see to it that I knew everything I need to know about Claire, yeah. you would have been pissed at me. But I, looking back, though, I wouldn't have thought you didn't have authority right. to do it. Yeah, That's right. Yeah, which is... And that's how gross... The, the, the level of scary and dark and... Yeah, and, no, I get it. I understand And really, this... See, my, my having been involved with this stuff and doing this stuff and thus establishing this new standard in which security concerns were addressed is what I found that our viewing and listening public need to know because yeah. it helps complete, it puts another big piece to this big puzzle of what kind of shit were we involved in? Right. You know what I mean? No, absolutely. Kind of so, so getting back to it, so so we talked about life history. What else were some of the... Well, the... like I said, then when the mail would come in, we'd capture any bank information. Um, I remember one uh, person that we would start evaluating. Some, some staff would get annual gifts. Some were monetary. Some would be care packages from their parents. Like I'll give an example for Ron Cook as an example. He'd always get new sets of socks and underwear from his mom every year Aww. for Christmas. That's a precious gener you know, generated a precious gift from his mom. Right. And with it would come chocolate chip cookies. He would have Ziploc bags and bags. Like his box came. It was pretty incredible because he would give us some. Or um, there was a couple staff members that got that were tied into a large inheritance that would get these large checks. Hmm. And I would have to report on those particular people. Um, um, which and I who would, really felt, huh? yeah, who, sorry, just for perspective, who were you reporting to on that? Uh, their internal security RTC. Okay. Who would then forward the information. In other words, any and all personal aspects of anybody could be drawn from security, just a phone call away. Jackson, I need this information. If somebody wanted the bank statement or the mother's name, name, I could afford it. Right. If somebody wanted to know what's the current state of someone's birthing, I would run out, do an inspection, and come back and give a report. So they had a current. Because another thing in Scientology is you can tell the state of somebody, the condition they're in by the state of their physical world. So you, if you walk into someone's home and you look at it, it's a mess, that's going to set an impression on you. So, right. Or if it's nicely taken care of, you're going to be... It sets an impression on you, the first impression. So we use that as a, a way to keep track of somebody without ever speaking to them. It's like, oh, as, they're, a, they're... as a yardstick of sorts. Yeah, as a yardstick of sorts to see yeah. how they're doing without them ever saying anything. So if somebody constantly lived or wore dirty clothes, we could naturally go up to them and go, listen, bud, what's up? And that would begin the process of a discovery that, you know, he committed a crime. Right. And thus my procedures on how to successfully pull out the people 
on the base that really underlyingly wanted to leave. I see. Does that make sense? Yep. It that's does. how we that's how we were utilized. Thus my drill, my security blow drill. Oddly I'm a little offended when people say Marty did it because I was the one submitted to Marty's ass. I don't say that for anything other. I want I want people to understand where the blow drill came from, how it came about, and the specifics of why these things are done and how they're done. Yeah. And then part of that also was relating to OSA. The, the, you would take certain parts of the data collection and feed it to OSA while I'm off tracking down where this person's at. I also know that OSA has been activated and they can do their thing. Right. And more importantly, as you said, yes, you developed it and you've corrected the record, but it was based on Hubbard policy. It was based on L. Ron Hubbard's policy. This is how you deal with situations. And the fact is somebody escaping the headquarters was a big situation in many in many circumstances. That's right. And, And over the course of a number of years, it became a very toxic, but acceptably a top toxic effort in terms of how we viewed somebody. I mean, there may have been this religious view of, oh, you poor soul, we have this to offer you. We can make you a better person as opposed to, we know you're a freaking criminal and we're going to get to the bottom of it before you even know what it is. Yeah. And these are the ways in which we did it. And just the control factor attached to that, that thought is just sickening. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Well, like I said, we have run out of time for wow. this segment. That Didn't that like just fly by? Weird. But um, I think next time we can get into sure. some more examples of, of kind of seeing how you saw that in play, how that blow drill got carried out. And as always, thank you so much for all of yeah. your time and sharing such oh, Claire, great information. Oh, Claire, I got more time than stories. you know to give you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I, I'm very grateful. I don't, I, you know, like, like me, you're, have this passion to educate people about Scientology and the true nature of it and as well as the dangers of it. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. All righty. Well, thank you again. And until next time. Yeah. Anyway, I'll tell you off. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You you have, you know, you know how Mark and you do this when you guys are on, you know, you guys can face each other and kiss on this line and say, (laughs) bye, honey. Wouldn't that be fabulously funny and cool? I don't think anyone's ever done it, Claire. You guys could just get used to just doing just that. Just go like this. Yeah, and then move into that line and just say kiss and then click off. You know, Because <laughs> everyone's falling in love with you, Claire. And Mark. It's... Oh, my Anyways, goodness. that would just be some fun. That that just, would be, it was a that funny would be little thought. That why, why point? is like, come yeah. on, Mark, kiss your beautiful bride. <laughs> Dude, just turn and go, mm, love you, honey. Thanks for your help. Thanks for your support to this. Thanks for well, clicking hey, all the stars. And just want to say, hey, you did a great job of lightening this up to finish up here. Oh, yeah. It's, I didn't. That's our nature, though, isn't it, Claire? How it much is. It's just a sign of our freedom. Yep, it and, absolutely is. And how is. beautifully we get to interact with each other now. So yeah. this is usually how our conversations end up. We talk about the tragedy and getting shit under our nails, and then we laugh. Yeah. This is with this each is other. the gift we have now. Yeah, so yeah, there yeah. You go. I, I love it. Yeah, I love it. So awesome. Well, on that note, until next time. Thank yeah, you. I'm, I'm going to kiss. I'm going to point. So <laughs> <laughs> did I say that out loud? There we go, Claire. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.